Hello, everyone. This is possibly my last video. <laughs> we'll see. Um, I have some things to share with you today that are not easy for me to share, but need to be shared. And I know for some people that know me, this is going to be a hard message to hear. And you're probably not going to want to hear it. And you're probably going to want to talk me out of it. I've already had enough of that for the last little while. As I've been realizing that I've been off for a little while, I've had a lot of people reach out to me trying to get me to reconsider what I'm saying and what I'm sharing right now. I don't think it has anything to do with me. I think it has to do with them and them not see, wanting to see things that they need to see um, for themselves. So I'm going to encourage you that if you decide to listen to this message, I hope you will do so with an open heart and a prayer in your heart that you will hear what you need to hear. Um, the Spirit will be able to speak to you. And that if you have questions or concerns that you please, please don't bring them to me. I'm not the Lord. I'm not, I'm not God. Bring them to Heavenly Father in humble, sincere prayer and get your own answers. So I'm just going to share my experience. I'm going to share my story from the last three years, a little over three years of my life. And I'm going to try to make this as succinct as I can and in hopes that it will help some people and that it will, um, I don't know, I just feel like I need to do it, so I'm going to do it. <sighs> this is hard. I have been going through a sorted out process for almost, um, goodness, like three weeks now something like that. And it has not been easy. It's been really, really hard to honestly look at my life and see it clearly for the last, for the last three years. It's not fun. Um, not when you thought you were doing a good thing. Not when you thought you were on the Lord's errand. So here we go. <laughs> I just said it is. Shoot you straight. I don't know what else to do. So um, about three years ago, a little over three years ago, I had a wake up call. I call it a wake up call because I feel like I was, I was before my wake up call is back up just a little bit before my wake up call. Um, I was the really steady president in my ward and I felt like that was a wake up call as well. I felt like that was, um, the Lord's way of trying to draw me back into fully being consecrated and doing his will. Um, I had gone through an experience before I moved to where I'm at now um, in Colorado. I had lived in a different place in Arizona. And during a little time period um, while I was there, I, I feel like I had a, a wake up call of sorts as well. And I feel like I was kind of put through the ringer. <laughs> um, my, my, with my discipleship and with my commitment to the Lord. And um, it was really hard. It was really hard. And when we moved away from that place, I went into hiding. I was like, I'm so done. That is so hard to live um, with that intensity and that, um, that much commitment to the gospel. It, it was challenging. I had opposition. I had, um, it was the first time in my life I felt like I was filling the spirit and teaching by the spirit. It was, it was really in some ways, absolutely incredible and in other ways, so taxing that I just was like, I don't know if I can keep doing this. So I kind of went into hiding and I basically decided I will live the gospel, but I, I, I want to not, I want to hide. I don't want people to notice me and I don't want to stand out and I don't want to be different because and different in the sense of just living the gospel, like standing out in the sense of following the spirit, because everybody wants to hear what the spirit has to say. <laughs> and so I don't know, I just, I tried to hide for a little while and I just kind of lived the very basics of the gospel, but not, not in inspired ways, like more like um, just duty, like check off your list, you know, kind of ways. And and I could feel that I was declining spiritually. I could feel that. Um, I could feel that I wasn't feeling very close to the to the to my Father and um, to the Spirit, and so and to the Lord. And so I I could feel that too. I could feel that slow decline 
and I guess spiritual death would be what that's called. And so then I was, I feel like given a wake up or shake up. <laughs> um, I was called to be the release any president in my ward, which I never ever wanted that calling. Well, not in my right mind anyways. And I, um, didn't, didn't want it, but I have a policy for myself that I, I will say yes to any calling that I'm given. Um, because I trust that those things are given, um, through revelation and, and that, um, I want to be an obedient kid. And so I, I have a, I always say yes policy. So I said yes, even though I was scared to death and um, accepted that calling. And immediately I started playing the spirit again, guiding me and, and leading me. And it was, it was really powerful because I hadn't felt spirit in a, in a while. And so it was really beautiful and I was grateful. But opposition comes as it always does. And I really was going through my own struggle of, I don't know, I call it like my, my rebellious teenage phase. I don't know how to explain it, but other than that, but just I um, didn't want to be different. I didn't want to be so sensitive to the things of the world, meaning the worldly things. I didn't, I didn't like that I felt like God held me to a really high standard and that when I listened to music or watched movies or read books that a lot of my um, fellow Latter-day Saints felt like, you know, were drawn to and felt totally fine with, um, that I would lose the spirit. If I would watch those things or listen to those things, read those things, which I would always feel like was not okay for me, um, that I would lose the spirit for like weeks and I'd have to work really hard to get back the spirit that I had lost, the feeling of feeling close to the Lord. And, um, and so I was kind of fighting that. I'm like, why do you hold me to such a high standard? Like, why, why, why do I get like, why do I get so punished when I make a choice that's against the spirit? And um, so I was kind of fighting that. And then I was getting opposition in my calling. And all I was asking people to do was to um, actually do what we're about to be asked to do. Um, going forward in the they're changing the, the visiting teaching way of visiting teaching which is less and less being told what to share and more and more seeking what should be shared or seeking to be basically led by the spirit and um, guided in your ministry to these beautiful sisters that we visit and that's how I was being trained to get our visiting teaching um, in that way to to basically pray pray to know what your sisters need and and let the spirit guide you on how to serve them and how to connect with them and really love your sisters and um it was stretching people they didn't want to have to pray they didn't want to have to get inspiration on how to help their sisters and so i had some kickback not not everybody but there was some kickback on that and i just i'm like i didn't want it i didn't i didn't ask for the calling i didn't want the calling and um and I don't like opposition and I don't like uh, people being upset with me. And so I just was like, oh, I don't want to do this. And, and I was already having my own struggles with, um, with Heavenly Father and his expectations of me. And so then, so I was struggling and I could feel it. And I could feel that I was tanking spiritually. I was starting to decline again and I could feel the pull of the world really, really strong on me. And I could feel temptations having more pull on me than they had, had um, in a while. And so I was just feeling this pull. And then um, I was, I could feel it. Like one day I was, I was working out in the gym and, and I had taken my workouts to the extreme. I was getting off track with that as well. I was using my working out to kind of hide, um, and I was, I was like very focused on the physical body and, and controlling that and getting that in shape and in order. And, um, and it felt good. It felt good to push my body and it felt good to work out. And I was using it to avoid <laughs> my life in many ways. And, um, but it felt good. So it made me feel good. And I felt like I was accomplishing something and I looked better than I had had, you know, my whole married life. So you know, that was good. But I could feel that I was getting more drawn out to other things and getting distracted and more tempted um, in, in many ways. And so um, I remember one day the, the temptation hit again. I was at the gym and, and I, um, 
and I could feel this pull to um, of temptation and I thought I'm going to fall I knew it I, I knew without a doubt that if I kept in the state that I was in I was going to fall and I grabbed the science of the workout machine and I just cried out tell me father I said please don't let go of me don't let go of me and but I didn't know how to get out of the pickle that I was getting into the spiritual decline that I was in and so I left the gym. That was actually the last time I went to the gym. I haven't been to the gym in three years. I'm not saying that's good or bad. I just haven't. And I had a visiting teaching appointment that day, I think. I'm pretty sure it was that same day. And thankfully, I'm a really obedient kid. Like, I really, I think that has saved me more times than I can count. Just this obedience to the basics of the gospel. Um, but I had a visiting teaching appointment. I did not feel like going on that appointment but I went on it anyways and it's with the person that I love and adore so you know why I was I just you know wasn't in a good place but I went didn't feel the spirit really strong or anything while we were visiting but um just like knew that I needed to do it and did and after the appointment was over as we were ending and we were kind of saying goodbye my my dear friend my dear sister that I visit said I just keep this keeps coming to me this keeps coming to me I feel like I'm supposed to share this with you um and so she told me about a woman named Julie Rowe, which some people will know and some people may not know who that is. Um, but Julie Rowe is a person who's had a near-death experience, and she was shown basically like the beginning of the world to the end of the world and um, the things that are specifically coming in our day. Nothing really new, nothing that hasn't been prophesied about, but basically she's another witness of those things and really that we need to get ourselves in order. We need to get our lives in order and listen to the prophets and um, get prepared and be spiritually strong because hard days are ahead and, um, and we need to quit wasting time. <laughs> and so, like, um, as she was telling me about this person, I felt the spirit. I just, I don't know how to say it. I just felt I really needed to read that person's book. Um, she just came out with her first book and... Um, it's actually the only one I've read, but she just came out with her first book and I think it's called The Greater Tomorrow or something like that. And, um, and I just felt you need to read that book. And so I was reading it and I, 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 I mean, I got it that night on the Kindle and I read it and I kept praying the whole time. I'm like praying, please, if this is truth, I want to know if it's not truth, tell me and I'll throw it away. Like I have no problems discarding this. And I just, I just need to know if this is truth or not, because if it is, I have wasted a lot of time and I need to get my act together. And, um, and so it wasn't until I think the 12th chapter or whatever, the chapter on the New Jerusalem, when I read that chapter, I felt the spirit and I knew that she was speaking truth. And I was like, Oh, geez, what in the world am, am I doing? I'm sitting here battling Heavenly Father, I'm just living the gospel and being diligent and living the gospel. And I'm sitting here battling him. And my battle is with the wrong thing. And I was like, oh, I have wasted so much time. What in the world, Amy? And so I was like, okay, recommit. Recommit yourself, Amy, and get dedicated and quit battling the Lord. And get your act together. <laughs> Thankfully, I'm a really obedient kid. And so really quickly, I realized I've already done a lot of the preparations of temporal preparations um, because we've been asked to do food storage and we've been asked to do, um, you know, 72 hour kits and three months supplies and things like that. And so I had already, we had already been doing those things because as I said, me and my husband are very obedient kids. And so we had followed the council. And so really I didn't have a ton that needed to get in order it was more like get your spiritual self, your spiritual self and house in order, Amy. And so I was like, okay. So I, I started on this journey. I read almost immediately after that, I read a book called Visions of Glory. I really loved that book too. Um, I thought it was um, really good. <laughs> I don't know. I know it gets a lot of controversy too, so I don't know what to tell you about that. But but I, I, I felt like it just kind of reinforced you know, this need to get in order and, and be spiritually in order and line up with the brethren of the church and, and stay, stay strong, stay active and, um, and quit resisting, <laughs> quit resisting. And so I did, I, I, I felt like, okay, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm all in. And then, um, not long after making those commitments, a few months later, I had a surgery and 
Oh, um, that was a, that was a very taxing surgery on my body. I don't know why, but it was, I got real, well, part of it was, I got really sick. I got sick and I lost a bunch of weight and I was really sick. Like, I don't, I really felt like I was dying. I don't know if that's truth or not, but I, I felt like it. And I was like, um, you know, just bring me home. Like, I'm okay. Just let's, can I just come home? Like, um, and I was actually praying. I was asking God if he'd just bring me home. You know, my family will be fine. They're strong, you know. Um, I've always struggled to be in this life. It's been a hard place for me. I, I, um, anyways, and so I was just like, I'm good. Just bring me home. And I didn't get the response that I, I was actually surprised by the response I got. And it was, are you ready to give up your summer cottage in Babylon yet? And I was like, What? Like, oh my goodness, like, and that was such a loaded statement, and I knew exactly what it meant. I knew exactly what it meant, because I have tried to commit myself to the Lord over and over again, and I keep turning back. I keep, like, Lot's wife, I keep looking back, and and it was like this, I need you once and for all, Amy. I need you totally all in. I need a full commitment with no turning back. Like, quit turning back. You put your hand to the plow, and then you look back on the world and you and you want to keep one foot in the world and one foot in the gospel and I need you once and for all that's that's really what he was asking that's what he was saying that's what it meant to me when I heard that phrase and I was like <sighs> I had to think about it <laughs> it's like yes 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 I am all in this time I'm not turning back I'm all in and and then I had kind of a little bit of a miracle I um I had to rush to the bathroom because one of my problems was needing the toilet. <laughs> and so probably TMI, but I, I rushed into the bathroom. Well, I didn't rush. I could barely move. But I, I got into the bathroom to use the toilet. And when I sat down on the toilet, it was just this perfect moment. I live in kind of a really, well, at the time, the house that I was living in, it was a very dark house. It didn't have very good lighting. It was an older home. And my room specifically was like, pitch black and and because of the curtains that I had on there and then my bathroom had this little bitty window that only one time of the day the sunlight would come through that window and I literally I sat on the toilet <laughs> looking at that little bitty window and right then the light of the sun came through that window and when it landed on me I felt the sickness just the, the sickness I felt like was ending my life just lift from my body and it was it was taken except for one thing and that was so that I would stay in bed and and um, get some instruction I think um, and so but but everything else like I totally felt fine I felt the clarity of mind I mean not long before that I had looked in the mirror and I had the glassy eyes like like, like and I looked so sunken and hollow and my my just anyways it looked really bad it looked like like death like what people look like right before they lead this life so anyways that was gone the glassy eyes were gone my eyes were fully back and present and I felt my spirit fully back and present. I don't know how to explain it I just felt life again in my body and I felt um like I was gonna live <laughs> be okay and um and so I was like all in I was ready I was so fully committed and ready to just live the gospel quit hiding live true to what I know is truth and all in and this is why this, this is so hard for me. So I'm fully committed, right? I'm going to do this. And with it not very long of that, I get introduced to some things. And I thought they were from God. I really thought they were from God. And, but there were red flags, you guys. There were red flags. And I have already been down this road once before and it almost cost me everything that mattered to me. It almost cost me my marriage and my children. I have been down the path of deception before. Back in um, 2003, and <laughs> I thought I learned, I thought I learned. I knew the red flags, I knew them, and I was, dedicated. I was ready to do what God wanted me to do. And I got distracted right away, like within not very long. I got totally distracted. 
and it was the same pattern, the exact same pattern, different um, experiences, kind of, but the same exact pattern. Um, I got caught up in excitement. I got it caught up in um, in things that I already knew had got were part of my last experience, and so I was really like nervous to get it. I was like, "Wait, are you sure? Are you sure?" And I was, but I didn't. I didn't question it enough. I didn't question the red flags enough. I didn't counsel with my husband like I should have done. I didn't counsel. Um, I didn't listen to him. He felt the red flags. He was not comfortable with the things that I was getting into. And yet I just disregarded him completely. Like, and that was the same pattern that I fell for last time is anybody that told me that I was wrong or getting off, I would fight against them. I would, I would be really, um, aggressive and I would be really not humble about it and like you don't know like the Lord is telling me to do these things I am on the right track I'm doing what I need to be doing and yet I was going against the basic basic stuff that our gospel teaches um, I have I am if you look at the family proclamation it very clearly spells out the divine role of male and female, the divine role of the man and the woman in the marriage and in, in parenting. And it's very clear. And in our society, nobody wants to hear that. I shouldn't say nobody, but a lot of people do not want to hear that. They don't like it. And they fight us because of that. They do not like our, our church because of it, because God very clearly spells out the divine role of male and female. And, um, and so <sighs> so let me just tell you what some of the red flags are because I've, I've affected a lot of people. This is what makes this really hard is that I have affected a lot of people and I can't take that back. I, I can't fix that. I don't know how to fix that except for just telling, what, telling my story and hoping that it helps some people. But I started going to trainings, and I'm going to tell you who I went to, and I'm not saying that they're good or bad. I'm not saying that. I don't know. That's something you've got to pray about and figure out for yourself. But let me tell you that there were red flags right from the beginning. Um, I, this is hard because I don't want to demean anybody. Um, but I, started, I, I had a friend who really encouraged me to go see one of their mentors, to go to a training by one of their mentors that they trusted. And, and this, this person, I, I, this is so hard because I really love these people. I really do. And I do not want to discredit people. Like, I, I don't. <laughs> but um, I just I have to speak my truth. And, and you guys can let, let the chips fall where they may, I guess. So I got, she said, you know, there's my, my mentor, my trainer. I just really want you to, to go to one of his courses. I didn't even know what I was going to. Um, but I felt like, okay, I'll go. And, and I just, I, I, I just knew that I wanted to go to that training and I thought it was being inspired. I thought I was being inspired to go to that training and my husband did not feel comfortable with it. He didn't understand what I was doing, but I didn't care. I, I just was like, no, you're going to try to stop me. You're going to try to stop me from doing what I feel like I need to be doing. And I didn't, I didn't counsel with him. I didn't honor him and his ability to receive inspiration for our family. And this was affecting my family. You gotta keep that in mind. I'm a mother. My primary role is the nurture of my children. So keep that in mind. One of my primary roles, in fact, it's the only one that it actually spells out to me is the primary role is the nurturer. My husband's primary role is to provide, preside, think about that word, preside, and protect the family okay he's a protector he's a provider and he's a presider in our home and I've made covenants in the temple to follow him and to let him lead I've made covenants that as long as he is following the Lord that I will hearken to him and so um, I didn't even consider his feelings I didn't even counsel with him I didn't want to counsel with him because I knew he'd probably tell me no He'd probably say that it was he didn't feel comfortable with it, and he didn't. But he let me go because he knows I'm really stubborn and I'm really strong-willed, and I can get really scary and mean and bully when I am feeling challenged. 
this is so hard. This is so hard to, to realize how awful <laughs> you are. And, and I'm a bully. And, and I, when I'm in the natural woman, I'm a bully. That's one of my energies is to go into bully. That's the fight energy, which I've learned a lot about the natural man over the last year. And oh my goodness, and realized how um, I have mastered all four of the trauma energies and I know how to use them to manipulate, control, change a situation. Oh, you guys, I hate the natural man. I hate the natural woman in me. I believe that I have never purposely tried to lead anyone astray. I, I honestly, I have not tried to mess people up. I have not sought to do that. I, I want you to know that. And I don't think that a lot of these people that I've been guided to or the people that I personally know have done it either. I don't think that they have actively tried to lead someone astray. I don't believe that they believe that they're doing that. And I don't, um, I know it's kind of like when Christ was on the cross and he looked down upon the Roman soldiers and he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I feel that way about my friends. I feel that way about the people that I've been guided to or that I've gone to. Um, I feel that way about myself. It's like, I didn't know. I would never have done it on purpose. I, I did not know. But I will tell you this, this whole time I'm going through this journey, seeking out these mentors and these trainers, I didn't have the backing of my family or my husband. And that was one of the first things I was taught by my first trainer was, as you wake up and have your mind, you know, kind of blown and woken up, you're not going to get supported. People are going to fight you on that. And so I took it as a warning from God that my husband would fight me, my children would fight me, my family who I love and love me will fight me, meaning my, my, my family, not my my children and my husband, but my extended family, that they'll fight you on that. And that's a sign that you're kind of on the right track and, you know, just kind of expect that there's going to be an opposition in, in what you're doing. And um, guys, these are people that love me. These, why would I not want to hear their counsel? Why would I not at least be willing to hear them out and in humility and openness? Like, Seriously, because these are the people who will stand by me no matter what they have. Both times, <laughs> both times they have loved me. I think they were scared of me this time around because I was so, uh, I was pretty mean the last time around to them when they thought I was off and I was off, but I didn't think I was off and I was following the Lord. Um, and so I think I've scared them because I'm kind of a bully and I'm, I'm a very strong personality. And so I think they were scared. They were scared. They, they tried some, they, like most of my family was silent. They didn't want to say anything to me. And yet I could feel, I could feel that they felt like I was getting off. I could feel that. I could feel their fear. I could feel their concern for me. And yet I had already been prepped for it, <laughs> pre-prepped, that as I made these changes and made these shifts and these adjustments in my life, that I would get opposition most likely from my friends and family. Um, and so I just assumed that, that was the adversary influencing them and, um, yeah, same scenario that I went through last time. So, um, this is, so this is really challenging. So I went to my first, my first mentor, which he's affected a lot of people. And like I said, I'm not his judge. I'm not going to tell you he's bad or not. I, I don't know. But, um, but I know that for me, I was getting off. So Kirk Duncan was my first mentor. And, um, and it wasn't long after that that I started feeling like I needed to create a bunch of programs and I needed to do all these different things. My husband was struggling with that <laughs> because I was not having time for my family and it pretty much consumed my life. I am a person who, when I decide to do something, I am all in, I'm 100% on anything I decide to do and that grabs my attention. And I know that I go to extremes. I know it. I, you guys, the countless hours, the countless hours that I did, I took and put into these programs to create these programs. I pushed my family aside. I pushed my family aside over and over and over again. And I made them feel like they were nothing, that they were not worth my time, that what I was doing was more important. And God was telling me to do it. Do you realize what damage that? probably has caused my family to 
to put it on God, that God was encouraging me to not spend time with them, to focus on other people more and care more about helping other people than my own family. The damage that that's caused, oh, geez. Yeah, this is a hard wake-up call for me. I've wasted three years of my family's life, three years that I can't get back. I cannot get back. My little boy was just a little baby. One and a half years old. I'll never get that back, you guys. My primary role was to be a mother. The exceptions in the family proclamation are when you have an exception to that, right? Like death, disability, or other circumstances may necessitate a need for adaptation. Where was mine? My husband was alive and well. My husband was working and creating plenty of money to support our family. So. I didn't need to work. Um, I wasn't living in moderation, you guys. I wasn't living in moderation. I was creating all these different things and I would go from one exciting thing to the next, one exciting trading to the next. And all the money that I would bring in through the business was going into new trainings, new exciting trainings, um, new exciting education and, and things that I wanted to learn. And, um, I would feel red flags. I would feel like, oh, I don't know how I feel about that. Like energy work, for example, learning quantum touch and learning Reiki and all that stuff, muscle testing. For me, I was like, muscle testing, like that's, that's what I got into last time. Like, and I'm like, and I didn't, I felt like that was just like, not good. Like I, I didn't feel good about it. And so I was like, but I was like, well, you know, I, I'm, I feel like I'm being guided. I, I committed that I would be all in. I committed that I would do these things. And, um, I'm one of those persons that when I commit, I keep my commitments except for the ones that are actually real and true, like my temple covenant commitments and my motherhood commitments. Right. So but I, I felt good. I was making a difference in people's lives. And I was like, and, and people would say nice things to me. And I thought, I am, I'm doing it. I'm doing a great work and I cannot come down. That's kind of what I felt like. I would tell my family, like, I'm doing a great work and you guys are not supporting me. You're like my worst enemies. Like you guys should be supporting me. And I think about the countless hours that people who did support me have put in to helping me and how much Neglect has happened in their own families because of the distraction of what I've been doing. This is really hard. So I know in sharing this message that I'm hurting people because they don't want to hear these things. They don't want to see that they've been off. But you guys, the gospel is really, really simple. And I have a beautiful role to fulfill. And I love my role as mother. And I don't think that everything I've done over the last little while has been all evil or bad. I, there has to be enough good that you fall for it. Like, there has to be enough good. There has to be enough good to offset the distraction, like, level so that you feel like, I'm doing a good thing, I'm doing a good thing. Otherwise, you wouldn't do it. How else would the adversary get people like us who have good hearts who just want to help other people, how else would he get us? How else would he get us, you guys? Think about it. There has to be enough good mingled in there to, to get you to feel like you're okay and you can justify you're pushing your family away and you can justify spending the money on these different things when... So, okay, gosh, I don't know what, what else to say. So, um, what woke me up? What finally helped me see it? That this has been so stinking hard. So what helped me far, finally start like seeing it was a oh, really awful, horrible experience. But it was enough that it was like scary enough that it it like caught my attention enough, I guess. Um, oh my goodness, I just don't even know what all I'm supposed to share. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> um, I just don't want to hurt anybody, but I love you enough to say something. That's honestly what's motivating me because I would rather just to close everything down and not say anything to anybody <laughs> because I don't like, um, I don't want to, I'm not your judge. And this is something you're going to need to pray about and find out your own answers for. But because I feel like some of the things I've learned are truth and they're good and they've helped me and, and they've helped others. And so it's like really hard. It's like, ah. <laughs> Ah, but let me tell you, the gospel of Jesus Christ is real and true, and it's on this earth, and it's simple, 
and it's beautiful. And we don't need to recreate the will. Yes, our thoughts matter. Yes, our heart matters and the state of our heart matters. But you can learn how to heal for free through the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can learn how to heal others when it's according to God's will through the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is a gift of healing, and it is real. There is the prayer of faith, and it is real. This is where it's so hard for me because like energy is real. Energy work is real. If you think about energy work, every thought you think is energy. Every feeling you have is energy. It carries a vibration that has energy and, and power. God literally created things with words. Um, every, ener everything's energy. And so where's the deception? Where's the offness? It's the distraction away from the basics. Guys, we're getting distracted. We're getting distracted. You can heal for free. Did you know that? <laughs> you can heal for free. You don't need my programs. You don't need, you don't need to spend a bunch of money. God himself said, come, come and buy without money. You can have the gospel. Is there a sacrifice? Yes, there is a sacrifice in all things. Absolutely. To follow the Lord is a sacrifice. you got to be willing to give up some things, for sure. But it doesn't break the bank to learn these things. It doesn't um, put you at odds with your spouse, which I see a lot of. Is the I was. I was at odds with my spouse the whole time. Like The only thing that brought some peace is when I finally had enough money coming in for my business to pay for all my trainings and all the things I wanted to go learn and do. Um, and that brought peace because I wasn't asking him for money anymore. I wasn't asking. And, oh, you guys, I don't know what to tell you except for please listen to the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They know what they're doing. They know what they're saying. And if, if nothing else, I will tell you, one of my policies that has saved my life in this case has saved me and reeled me back in is that I stand with the brethren of the church, even if I disagree. And I did. I have disagreed. Let me tell you. Oh my goodness, I have disagreed. Because it's been counter to what I've been experiencing. And I've had real experiences. You guys, I've had real experiences. I've had visitations, heavenly visitations over the last three years. I've had angels come and minister to me over the last three years. I've witnessed what I felt like were miracles over the last three years as well. I have had these experiences, which is why it's made me hard. It made it hard for me to even want to see this as what it really is. Now, I didn't see them with my natural eyes. It was my spiritual, my, my senses, I guess, my, my senses. But I, I've had ministry experiences, but guess what? They were not in the light. And that is so hard to admit. That's been one of the hardest things for me to admit to myself. Is that those experiences were not real. I'm not saying that God doesn't have angels and he doesn't visit us and that he can't, we can't have the cool experiences that we see in the scriptures. I'm not saying that. But I will tell you this. My experience was not like Moses' experience. When I felt the Lord was coming to me, I didn't feel my own nothingness. I didn't fall down and want to, um, uh, I didn't, I did, wasn't overcoming. It didn't, um, didn't overwhelm me, you guys. And I didn't feel like I needed to worship this being in the sense of what people that really experienced Christ with humility fell before his feet and recognized that their God was there with them and were willing to give up all their sins to know him and were willing to do um, in righteous ways the things that he would. I, I, it's so hard to explain this because I know you're having real experiences. I'm not doubting that. I did too. They were very real to me. Very, very real to me. But the, diff the difference, oh, the difference, you guys. I, I, wish, I wish I could spell it out so clearly for you. But Elder Ballard, in this last um, conference, the October 2017 General Conference, gave a talk called The Trek Continues. And tucked within it was a beautiful, horrible message for people who are off track. 
It was a beautiful message to those who were not off track. They weren't triggered by it at all. But the people that were triggered by it, you guys, if you're triggered by what one of the general authorities is teaching, there's a reason why. And it's not because they're deceived. It's not because they're off. You guys, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not a buffet where you pick and choose what you want to accept because it ties in with what you personally believe. It is the truth. And if we want to stay on the right path, on that, that straight and narrow path, and we want to build a strong foundation that's built upon God, like truly built upon the Savior Jesus Christ who speaks through prophets, seers, and revelators, which we know that. Amos 3.7 is very clear about that. God speaks through his prophets. And we have prophets, and you can know that for yourself, and I do know that. There's a few things I do know, guys. I know that these men are prophets, seers, and revelators. I absolutely know that. I know that the Book of Mormon is the word of God. I know that Joseph Smith was a true prophet because the Spirit has borne witness to my soul, and I cannot deny it, nor would I dare deny those things. So I know those things, and I also know that the adversary is real, and I know that he can transform himself nigh into an angel of light, and he can deceive people. And what he does is he gets them off on these 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 sidetracks, these tangents. And one of the biggest one that I'm seeing right now is like when he appeared to Moses, right? He said, Moses, son of man, worship me. I am the only begotten, worship me. Christ leads us to father. Satan leads us to himself. He wants all the glory. Nothing's changed, you guys. The plan, it's not changed. He just hasn't changed. He wants us to worship him. And Moses recognized the difference. He said, where's your glory that I should worship you? Like, I couldn't even see the Lord with my natural eyes. I, I had to be transformed. There had to be a change that was made. And I can look upon you with my natural eyes. Now, I had not had the adversary show up with where my natural eyes could see him. I, this has all been uh, spiritually discerned or like spiritually discerned. I can feel spirits. And I can feel them around me and I can sense and see. I can even see facial expression in my, with my mind's eye or whatever, but I've never seen them. With, if they had shown up in my space physically, I would have known for sure. I would have been able to detect it faster. You know why? Because I know how to detect that. I know because the scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants teaches you what to do. If an angel shows up in your space, you can put it to the test. You guys, did you know that? You can ask them to shake hands with you. They, Satan and his minions cannot resist the temptation to shake your hand. And so they will put out their hand. And when you shake, go to shake their hand, you'll feel nothing. And that's how you can detect a false messenger from God's messengers if they actually show up in your physical space where you can see. And a true messenger, if they're a resurrected being, will shake your hand and they'll deliver the message. A non-resurrected being, meaning a, a righteous uh, person, who is on the Lord's errand but does not have a resurrected body yet, they will not try to shake your hand because they're not going to try to deceive you, and, but they will still deliver the message. But they will not try to say, shake your hand because they will not try to deceive you because they know they can't. They know that you will not be able to feel that because they don't have a resurrected body. So I already knew that, and I think that the adversary knew that I knew that, and so he didn't try to show up. I think if he didn't know that I knew that, he probably would have tried to show up and, as an angel of light that I could see and deceive me that way. Um, Cause I know that he does that to people, but anyways, so he didn't. And that's what made it a little more tricky is because even though I had red flags the whole time, you guys, I had red flags, but I didn't test them. I didn't, I didn't want to see them. I was so excited about what I was doing. I was so caught up in the excitement of all this, you know, this knowledge and these new experiences that the mainstream of the church which is another red flag, guys. When you start getting off of the mainstream of the church, the main body of the church and what it's focused on, be careful. It's in the fringes. It's in the extremes. It's in those outer skirts, those outskirts that the adversary likes to get us, those distractions. One degree, it only takes one degree over the course of time to get you like, you thought you were headed here, and now you're clear over, you can't even see it. You're clear over here, okay? Um, that's all it takes. Oh, so my saving grace, I kind of mentioned that before, is that I stand with the brethren. And I have always, I promised myself that no matter how I feel, if I get told by a leader who has a stewardship over me that I'm off, I will stop. I will stop and course correct. And I, I've been telling, I've been like, okay, 
if I'm off, just, you know, if a leader tells me, but guys, I don't know how long I would have made it on the path that I'm on before I would have discounted my own counsel to myself that I always stand with the brethren. Because here's the thing. I had, I watched a face-to-face -face with Elder Holland and um, El President Irie, and it triggered me. When they started talking about how we should approach Heavenly Father in prayer and how it is such a sacred experience and how, you know, we need to be so uh, humble and reverent about this. And it's a beautiful message. But I, it triggered me. I didn't like it because it made me feel like the relationship that I had with Heavenly Father was not the same as what they were describing. I was like, we're like best buddies and we're like really close and, and, and me and the Lord as well, me and Jesus Christ. So we're like really close and, and we're buddies. And, and I don't feel like I, ha I have this major overwhelming sense of reverent awe. And, um, and I was offended. I was offended by that message. I really struggled with that message because I was like, they don't know the Lord like I know the Lord. Do you realize how ludicrous that is? These men, do you know what makes them special witnesses of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know? Do you know what that is? Go to the Bible dictionary. You don't need to take my word for this. Go to the Bible dictionary. Look up the word apostle. They literally can testify of the physical, the bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many people can do that? I know that there's people that can besides them, but, but, but I'm not one of them. And uh, many of the people that I've listened to, they can't testify that they've touched and handled his physical resurrected body in the flesh. Like they cannot testify to that. They have had these experiences that they're having with the Savior, but not in that way. And, and so just be mindful of that. So these are prophets, seers, and revelators who have been called by, the, by God the Lord leads his church, and, and he, he's called them. They're special witnesses, and they can testify that they know that they've handled and seen his physical uh, resurrected immortal body. And yet they're telling us that there is a very sacred feeling when they go to pray to their Heavenly Father, when they go to approach the throne of grace, when they go what in the world makes me think that my relationship should be different than theirs? Does that make sense? Can you see that? So that triggered me. I'll tell you another thing that triggered me. So that one came out that bothered me. Then there was about a year ago there, this was not a year ago. This was sooner than that, but there was about a year ago, there was um, a message that came out from the church, uh, a, a letter and I'm not, you can go look these up guys. I wasn't planning. I don't even know what I was going to say. Honestly, when I started this recording, I had no clue what I'd be saying to you. So, um, there was a letter that talked about, um, being really careful about people who are sharing their personal experiences, um, being careful about that. And then there was also another letter that was about, um, this energy work movement, the energy healing work movement that's happening and counseling and, and, and caution. And then Elder Ballard in his last, this last talk, the trek continues, depending on when you hear this, um, reiterated their counsel in that as well. And it also went through like listening to people that do not have a stewardship who have not been called and set apart and sustained by the general membership of the church. Um, like don't listen to them. In fact, it's very like, specific maybe i should pull that up like don't listen to them and like oh my goodness you guys <sighs> do we realize what that's saying like have we thought about did it trigger you and, it, and if it did have you done something about it besides fight against it have you actually been humble enough to say lord like is it i like am i off why am i why am i being triggered by this this is what i'm saying we have a personal revelation line, and this is where a lot of people are getting off right now is through the personal revelation line. You can receive personal revelation, but do you realize that you're receiving it constantly from both sources, from the adversary and from God? There's two sources that are coming at you, and you have your own thoughts, your own opinions, your own feelings. And so we got to be careful about that. We can't, we can't just take everything we hear as that's from God. Do we, do we challenge it? How do you challenge it? How do you check it? Checks and balances, right? How do you check it to make sure that it's really from God? Are you brave enough to listen to your leaders? Are you brave enough to go talk to your bishop about it and be humble and listen to his counsel? Are you brave enough to go to your state president if needed? Like, 
are we humble? Like, are we truly humble? I can't tell you how many people have come to me and said, if I ever get challenged by one of my leaders on what I'm doing, especially with energy work, that they really struggle. They, they really don't know if they're going to stay active or if they're going to follow the counsel of their leaders because they know what they've experienced. Check yourself, please. There is a reason why we have a priesthood line of revelation and not just a personal revelation line. That is what makes the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that is what defines us and very much separates us from the rest of the world is we have a priesthood line. We have the power of the priesthood. We have God's authority in our church. And we have leaders who speak for him. And I know that there has been damage and trauma and sometimes they make mistakes. I get that. I get that, you guys. But I'm telling you that it's not a buffet. The, God tells us what the doctrine is. We can choose to line up with it or not. Nobody's going to make you do anything. You get to choose. But I'm telling you, these men speak the truth. And if you want what you want, and if you want to follow the God you think you're following, you will be in line with the brethren. Because if you're not in line with the brethren, you're following a false God. And I'm sorry, I'm just calling it as it is. And I am guilty. Guilty. Guilty as charged, okay? I'm just as guilty. And I'm sorry. And I'm sorry for all the distractions. And I have neglected my family for three years. I've been distracted by a false God. And it's appealed to my pride. It's appealed to my ego. It's appealed, as much as I hate to admit it, it has appealed to those things. Not everything I've learned is bad. Not all of it is light. But I have been distracted. And there is healing, but it doesn't cost anything. There is um, mentoring available to everyone. I can't tell you how many times I thought, why am I mentoring people when the church teaches the exact same things? Maybe I should just let people know about the, the stuff that I find on the church website because a lot of the stuff that I teach is what you can find for free on the church website. Like, why are we seeking out? Why are we going all over the place looking for answers when the answers are literally right there in front of us and always have been? And I just don't. And we're spending all this time and all this money, and sometimes it's free. And not all of it costs money. A lot of the stuff I did was free for a long time. Um, it's not all costing money, but where is your focus? How much time are you spending listening to all these other teachers? And how much time are you giving to God's appointed servants? Like how much time, like, let's be honest. Let's, let's just be honest for a minute. How much time are you actually spending reading the scriptures and the conference talks, the words of the living prophets, seers, and revelators? And how much time are you spending in other sources? That, that's, that's the question I have for you. I can't answer that for you, but I can answer it for me. Countless hours. Countless hours I was listening to other trainings, trainings on energy work, trainings on um, everything else. The books that I was most excited to read were not the scriptures, you guys. I had the hardest time sitting down and reading the doctrine. And I know for a fact that I don't retain even a fraction of as much if I don't actually read the doctrine. Now, I have eyes and I can see. Not everybody has that. And so hearing the doctrine may, may be what they need to do because that's what they have. But I have eyes and I can see. And I know for a fact that for me, I get a thousand times more information when I will study, when I will sit down and study the conference talks and study the scriptures. And I wasn't doing that, you guys. I haven't been doing that for years. I've been listening. I will listen to scriptures because I'm, I'm a creature of habit and I know that I've got to be doing that and, and I've got to be okay, right? And so I've been listening. I listen to conference talks. I listen to scriptures, but I know that my, my, my ability to recall scripture used to be phenomenal. I used to be able to tell you exactly where it was located, who said it, when it was said. I, I, and I know that that was a gift of the spirit because I, have a, I hurt my head and I have had, um, I've had a very hard time remembering things because of that from when I was 18. And so I knew that that was a miracle. Every time I could quote a scripture, I could tell you where something was in a conference talk or when, you know, any of that stuff, that was by the spirit. I knew that that was a gift of the spirit. But guys, I was living off of my own, like 
knowledge and my own study that I had done for years and years and years. And I've been a really faithful student of the gospel and I've studied and studied and studied, but I can tell you it was getting hard. It was getting hard for me to remember quotes exactly. And it was getting hard for me to remember scriptures exactly. It was get, I couldn't remember where they were located anymore. I was fading. My, my well, my well was getting empty it, and it was getting less and less and less, but I could remember all the other things I'd studied. I had been studying a lot of other things and the stuff that, that um, validated what I was learning in outside sources, I could remember those things. So think of that one or figure that one out. So, but I had not, I'd been listening, but I had not been reading and I knew that. And I felt, I kept getting these like, Amy, you need to read. Amy, you need to read. And I wouldn't, I didn't do it. I would, sometimes I'd read like a verse or whatever to just appease my conscience. But I, oh my goodness, you guys. But I could sit down. I have like all the books that I kept in my, my bathroom started shifting. Like I, I had some doctrinal books, but I rarely picked them up. Uh, mostly what I had in there was um, just other resources, lots of other books that, I, that interested me. And I would pick those up and I'd read those no problem. And I'd be marking them up and so excited about what I was learning. <sighs> you guys, I don't know if this is going to help you or not, but I felt like I was supposed to share it. And I don't even know where I go from here. I don't know if I'm supposed to counsel my whole website. I, I don't know what to do about that because I've got people who have bought my programs and they've paid for them. And I don't know, I don't have the funds to reimburse them for that. I've used it all on education and, and keeping my website going and keeping my programs going and creating new programs. And, and so I don't even know what to do about that. Like, I'm like, I don't even know what to do, but I can't in good conscience encourage people to my programs anymore. What I can encourage them in very good conscience is to go to the church website. You want to learn about becoming mentally strong, emotionally strong, and spiritually strong, and physically stronger? It's in there. It's on there. You, it's free. Most of it. Like finances. You want to learn about finances? They've got that. You want to learn about like what do they not have? You guys. They they counsel us on everything, and and yeah. I mean, they do encourage us to go see you know licensed practitioners and health and health practitioners for mental emotional stuff. I'm not one of those either. I've told people that all along. I'm like I'm I'm a mentor. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to do from here, but I know that I love you guys. And I know that I'm sharing this from my heart. And I'm sorry. I'm really, really, really sorry. And I'm sorry for any damage I've caused. As I said, I don't think everything I've said is bad. I think that there was a lot of truth in what I said. But if you want the whole truth, please go to the source. LDS.org, my friends, go to LDS.org and start searching. There's some free information. You can have it night or day, anytime. And it's there for you. I do believe in mentoring. I think that it has great power and, and, and efficacy. And I plan on mentoring my family. And I plan on helping others. And I plan on serving the Lord. Um, I've just got to get myself in order. And then we'll see what comes of that. But I love you guys so much. And I hope you can forgive me. And I want everyone to know that I have been, that I have connected with. Like I've learned energy work from lots of different sources. And um, I, I've just, I've been led to a lot of different things. Um, I forgive you all. I, I don't, there is no, there's no uh, bad feelings in my heart whatsoever. I really, I really feel like Father forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Like, because I felt like the same way about myself. And um, I do, I recently, my last little thing that I came in contact with was pure evil. I, I know that. Like, it was truly like um, pure evil. And it was in like a couple different PDFs and books and anyways. And I, I, I still think those people were deceived. I, I think that they were, they really probably didn't have a clue what they were doing, that they were being used as a pawn in the adversary's hands, that their material was way more aggressive, I should say, like aggressive in getting people off. Um, follow the brethren, please. There was a, I read a conference talk, or not a conference talk, a BYU address this, just this morning. And it's basically encouraged me that I'm going to stick to the basic foundational doctrines of the church. It was by Bruce R. McConkie. Um, I posted it on my Facebook page. I think it's, um, I think it's our personal relationship with the Lord. Let me see if I can find it really quick. Um, because I think it was really good. And if you've gotten off and if you've gotten into some stuff that is not good, I think that this talk could help you get like realign yourself and see what, what is off. Um, but it, it really emphasizes like this, the false doctrines that are going around right now. 
um, okay, it's called our, Re our Relationship with the Lord. What has been going around a lot lately is this over-focus, this hyper-focus on a personal relationship with Christ. And this is tricky because we are counseled to seek out and have our second comforter experience, which is literally where you, you live in such a way that you, the veil is rent and you see the Savior and you can now testify that you know he lives. And that's a beautiful, powerful experience. And goodness, who, want, who doesn't want that? And a lot of people are seeking that right now. And I don't think it's a bad goal, but <laughs> um, I think we need to be careful. And I think it's one of the ways that the adversary is getting a lot of us right now, honestly, is through that um, because it's doctrinal. Um, and we are encouraged to seek, a, you know, to have these experiences, but live close, live, live close to the doctrines, you guys. Keep the doctrine pure. So our relationship with the Lord, I don't know why I have a weird wrong picture, but it was from Bruce R. McConkie. And it's specifically talks about, so um, I hate to even say this because I love John Pontius. I do. I love him. And I don't think he was trying to lead anyone astray. I really do not believe that. But I've seen a lot of people that are getting off and they've read his books. And, and the, this talk was given. Um, I, most people won't know who George Pace is, but George Pace was very similar to John Pontius. Very good guy very righteous, very amazing man. And his focus was also on having this really personal, deep relationship with the Lord. And um, he, he was a, a teacher at BYU. I don't know if he still is, but he was a teacher at BYU. He was probably the most popular, very favorite um, teacher there. And taught very much so about this personal, like singling out Christ, you know, and focusing on Christ and having this personal, really close, intimate relationship with Christ. And that's what John Pontius does as well. And so, like, I'm like, oh, my goodness. It's like the same scenario, different person, different. And I know, I know, I well, I do not believe. I do not believe that John Pontius is trying to do that to anybody. I don't think he's trying to get people off or out of the, in alignment with the brethren. I do not believe that for a second. Um, but anyways, George Pace, they didn't say his book specifically, but it was very clear for everybody that knew him because this was done at BYU, which is where he was teaching. And, and if you know about it and you know about the background, you would know that this is who one of the people he was calling out on this. And so George Pace was very humble. From what I know, he, he said, I side with the brother and I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to get anybody off. That was not my desire, paraphrasing, but I side with the brother and his family went inactive. He did not um, speaks volumes for his humility and his willingness to be humble about it. Um, anyways, we got to be really careful, you guys. So our relationship with the Lord, this talk was given in uh, March 2nd, 1982. It's a BYU devotional, and it's very clear. Like, it, it's really an awesome address, and I found it by chance. Um, I, was, I kept having this quote come to my mind that I couldn't, I couldn't remember the quote exactly, but it was something about staying in the mainstream of the church, in the main body of the church. And that's one of the ways to stay safe in our day, in our time. And so I was like, I, I just kept feeling like you need to look up that quote. You need to look up that quote. And as I did, this talk is what came up and I read it and I was like, oh my goodness, if I had read this three years ago, would this have saved me? And I'm not sure that it would have, you guys. I don't know if I would have gotten it. I don't know if it would have or not. <laughs> honestly, but I get it now. Now that I've been through what I've been through, I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. How important it is to keep the doctrine pure and how important it is to be careful and not get into extremes and not get distracted. And oh, anyways, all right. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions. I am not the answer to your questions, but I love you and I'm praying for you. I've been praying for all of us. I've been fasting for us and, um, um, you're precious, you're beautiful and precious souls. And I want you to stay in the boat, please. If I could encourage you to do nothing else, it's stay in the old ship Zion, stay with the brethren, stay with the main body of the church, please, please. I love you. I know that this is gonna be a soul searching time for you. I hope it will be. Um, it's been really hard. I have been up and down and up and down. This has been so hard to see. And it's been embarrassing and hard. But I am grateful. You have to understand that I am grateful. I would rather know the truth than find myself in a different location than what I thought I was going down. I, I, I want to be in the celestial kingdom, to go no more out. I want to have the highest degree of glory that there is. I want to be with Heavenly Father for all eternity. I want to be with my Savior, Jesus Christ. I want that. And I am grateful that God loved me enough to, to help me see that I was off, 
so I could course correct because even the matter of a few degrees, that wonderful talk by President McDorf, a matter of a few degrees will get you in a destination that was not your, what, where you thought you were going. And so it's very important that we get redirected. And, and so I am so grateful for that redirection. And even though this is hard and it's embarrassing and, you know, probably a lot of people will not trust me anymore and, and it's okay. I don't, I don't care. I, I want you to trust the brethren though, if nothing else, please, please. And so I love you guys. And this is Amy Benneville signing out. <laughs>